All right, let's try that again. Welcome to week 11. Almost the finish line. There are only three weeks left to go. Uh, today is actually a fairly straightforward topic because we don't cover it in depth. Uh, we're going to be talking about transactions. Transactions are... Excellent. No, my clicker. There we go. My clicker stopped working for a second. So we're going to be talking about transactions and recur recovery and concurrency. So we'll be talking about what transactions are for, how they're used, um, that kind of thing. So a transaction is an action or series of action carried out by a single user and application, which reads or updates the contents of a database. Now you guys are saying, well, that sounds like an insert statement or a delete statement or an update statement. Technically, yes, that is a transaction. Anything that modifies the content of the database is considered a transaction. So the next thought students usually have say, well, why do we need a lecture on the fact that we're changing the contents of the database is when transactions are actually affecting more than one thing at once. So a transaction is a unit of work. Uh, I actually teach transactions to my other group of students also, and we teach it slightly differently, uh, but they're taught that the transaction is a unit of work. So in theory, a unit of work could be more than just an insert, an update, or a delete. It could be an insert, then a delete. And both actions have to both work and complete successfully for it to be considered a valid transaction. Um, database servers have a way to group multiple SQL statements as a single unit of work. Um, the example that we normally use, and I bet you it's gonna be in one of the later slides, but since I'm talking about it, transferring money from one bank account to another bank account. Have you ever thought how that actually works? I work at a bank, so yeah. Okay, good for you, you know. The rest I of these people might not know. She don't know. Okay, you don't know, okay. So depending on which bank, I thought you were saying, I know all about this, so you can just, no, no, no. No, sorry, dude, I thought you'd, okay. So when somebody transfers money from one bank account to another bank, I'm not talking like from, it makes no difference if it's going from my checking to my savings or savings to checking or from my checking to somebody else's checking at the same bank. It's pretty much all done the exact same way. And different banks do this differently because I used to know someone that worked at CIBC as a programmer at CIBC. And I also happen to know somebody that worked as a programmer at TD. And TD and CIBC do these things opposite from each other. But in the end, they do the exact same steps. They just do it in a different order. So I want to take, I have, let me grab a marker. Way easier if I draw it on the board. And then I'll continue with the slides. Okay, we have two bank accounts. A, B. In A, we have $150. In B, we have $50. It's a student's bank account, right? And the student says, well, I need to save myself $25 for next week. So I want to take it out of my main account so I don't accidentally spend 25 bucks on a case of beer. So we're going to take 25 bucks from A and put it to B. So you pull it up, up there, web app, there, app on their phone, they go, okay, transfer 50 bucks, done. What actually is happening is there's multiple steps. And the steps are all the same, but depending on the bank, the order might be different. At this point in time, a transaction is initiated. They will take 150, they said putting 25 in B, so they're gonna put $25 in B. This is still sitting at $150. So now after this is done, we have $150, $75 here. Suddenly money has been printed. Once it verifies that this happened, it will then go minus 25. This stays at $75, and now this is $125. Hang on, let's take the worst curly bracket I ever drew. This is a transaction. It's a single unit of work. In other words, we are transferring money from one location to another. While this is happening, there's multiple steps. Each of these steps have to complete successfully for the transaction to be considered successful. If any of these steps fail, the whole thing has to be rolled back the way it was. So this is what happens in a bank account. 
whether it's your checking to your savings from your parents to you, or in my case, from me to my daughter, son, or as applicable, or, you know, whatever. This is how it works. So I'm not going to talk about e-transfers. That's a different kettle of fish altogether. Uh, but that's inside the database. These are the steps. If anybody here has ever studied accounting, this probably looks familiar to accounting also. Double entry accounting. That's basically what the bank is doing every time you transfer money. It actually either credits or debits one of the accounts. Make sure that work. Then it'll credit or debit the other account. So like CIBC, CIBC does this order. TD does it the other way around where they'll take $25 off. Once it knows the 25s are gone, it'll add the 25 on the other side. But the process is the same. In the end, the money moved from one place to another. So that's the general idea of a transaction. Transactions are important in the financial world. As you can imagine, if imagine that you started doing the transfer and then the computer shut the bed, but there's no transaction. Suddenly, you have 150 here and 75 there, and there's no trace of why that happened. And suddenly, you just gave somebody 25 bucks because the transaction there was no transaction and something failed. So when we talk about transactions, um, their unit of recovery consistency and integrity. So that means that um, a single transaction encompasses several things at once and it's known as asset so you when you talk about transactions a tra proper transaction must be asset compliant it is atomic i'm not even going to try to say that word because every time i try to say it i only get it right once out of every five tries my mouth will not say that word but it has to be atomic in other words the entire transaction is considered one piece of work mm -hmm. If you cannot have any sub piece of the transaction fail and survive. So the whole thing's considered as one task. We all have things like that. We consider all as one task every day. Getting out of bed is a transaction. You're sleeping, alarm goes off. At some point, you're actually vertical. Somehow, any of the steps between alarm going off and you being vertical, any of those fail, the transaction fails, right? You actually have transactions in your daily life where even though it sounds like a single task, it's really a bunch of different tasks that are all linked together that need to be successful to finish the job. So that's what atomic means. It means that the whole thing cannot be divided. It's self-contained as one unit of work. Whether it's one task, 25 tasks, makes no difference as long as it's self-contained. Consistency. Consistency means that... The database is consistent before and after the transaction is completed. In other words, we don't have rogue pieces of data floating around. It doesn't mean the data is going to be exactly the same. It just means that whatever is here reflects whatever the action was supposed to be. That's consistent. Isolation. Isolation is really cool. It's saying that this transaction is isolated from everything else. While this is happening, nobody can look inside the bubble. Begin transaction, commit transaction. Between this step and this step, nobody but the transaction manager gets to see what's actually happening. So in theory, we could start the transaction here. And if it, this didn't happen in a microsecond, like let's say it took two minutes, and then you go and you spend $150, you'd reach down here and say, oh, that can't happen because there was a transaction happening. And that, the processes don't see each other until... Everything's committed at the end. Uh, durability. Durability means once the database has reached the state that the transaction is completed, it stays completed. Even if the server blows up, melts down, whatever, once it's written to disk, it's there forever. Um, I like comparing that to a whiteboard and a piece of paper. The whiteboard is a transaction. Once you're done, you write it on the piece of paper with ink. You can never erase it again. Well, you can erase the whiteboard. So each transaction is a logical unit of work. Um, each transaction will do something in the database, whether it's just, it does one thing or does a bunch. Uh, no part of it alone achieves anything of user interest. In other words, if any piece fails, then it's not valid. Um, now, to give you guys a bit more detail on each of those acronyms, uh, the atomic side of it, 
means they don't have parts conceptually. Like obviously there might be multiple steps, but conceptually there are no sub parts. Going back to getting out of bed in the morning. How many steps do you think, because I love using this as a first programming exercise. People don't really realize how much work is involved in getting your ass out of bed in the morning. Those of us that are over a certain age actually know how much work it is to get out of bed in the morning. But you're laying on your back, your eyes are closed, alarm goes off. How many steps do you think there are from you getting out of, from that state to actually being vertical? One. Did you open your eyes? Yes. Did you turn off your alarm clock? Yes. How? Press the button. How? How? <laughs> See, these are all units of work, like pieces of that job. And you do any of these things and you fail. Right? If you've got an alarm clock like mine, I don't even need to lose my arm. I just hold my mouth and I say, stop. I got a smart clock. So stop. And it just stops ringing. Then I pray I'm getting out of bed. Sure. Right? And then, okay, now the alarm's done. You're still laying on your back. What are you going to do next? Oh, you got to uncover. Okay, well, how do you uncover? So each of those steps is part of that transaction. Even though you're just getting out of bed, there's so many little steps to actually accomplish that goal. And if you fail any of these, you're probably not getting out of bed that day. I'm going to cover. Failed. Transaction failed. Reset. Right? So that's what atomic means. It means that every single step has to succeed. Otherwise, it doesn't succeed. Regardless if it's only one step, 100 steps. Consistency. The database is taken from one consistent state into another. It's consistent before the transaction started. It's consistent once the data transaction has ended. Who cares what's happening in the middle? It's a scratch pad. The middle of the transaction, the database probably will not be consistent, like when we're transferring money from one bank account to another, because it's actually doing those two separate steps. Modern database systems, you know, even then, you think about it, right? you got two accounts, so you can't insert, update, or delete two different values into two different rows at the same time. That's not how it works, right? you got to do it row by row, so it's always going to be at least two steps. Isolation. The effects of the transaction are not visible to other transactions unless it's completed. Imagine there's somebody standing in the room watching you trying to get out of bed. All they know is you're asleep. Next thing they see is you're standing. They don't actually see all the steps of you trying to get your ass out of bed. They just see this to this. Because they don't actually see everything happening in between. It's just they went from a consistent state of being asleep to a consistent state of being standing. What happened in between is isolated. Nobody actually sees what's happening in those steps except for the stuff being manipulated. Um, from the outside, the transaction either happened or it did not. So again, the person standing in the room watching you get out of bed, you're still in bed, transaction failed, right? You turned off the alarm, fell back asleep, transaction failed. As far as the person standing there watching you, they never even saw you turn off the alarm. There's your alarm. Um, so isolation is a consequence of at atomicity or it being atomic because all the steps have to execute successfully for it to be consistent. Therefore, for it to be atomic, anybody else watching it cannot see all the different steps. It can only see the fact that the state changed. And then durability. Once it's done, it's complete. It, even if it crashes, it has to stay there. So that's what durability stands for. And here's our bank account example um, that I just did on the board. Um, atomic. You shouldn't be able to take money from A without giving it to B. Consistency. The total of the two accounts at the beginning and at the end should be the same. 200, 200. It's consistent. We did invent new money or make money disappear. Isolation. Nobody gets to see the actual process that transfers the money. Durability. Money got transferred. It's marked as complete. Server crashes. When the server comes back up, the money has not reappeared in A. Once it's committed, it stays committed. So... That every trans uh, every database server that supports transactions has a transaction manager. So there's a, a built-in service, you can call it, that sits there in memory, 
we're waiting for a transaction to start. And it uses a bunch of different techniques. And that's why we actually cover this very lightly. Because I know U of O has an actual entire course dedicated to transactions, an actual university, third level university course, just on how transactions work on the inside with all the relational math and all that fun stuff that goes in it. Um, well, thanks. I went to college. I really don't want to know what happens on the inside. But there's a lot of stuff that happens on the inside. So it uses locks and timestamps. So essentially what happens is it will, here, it'll create a timestamp to give you the rough idea of what's happening. It marks as a, as a timestamp. It takes a snapshot of the data it's operating on. It operates with that snapshot of data until it's done. It actually puts a lock on the table, then it applies it to the table when it's done. Um, there is a log. So essentially each of these steps are actually being logged to a, a log file, a binary log that keeps track of all the steps of the transaction. So if something fails, it's able to recover the transaction either by knowing what was done so it can undo it or by if it did succeed, but it never got written to disk, it can just replay it. <laughs> um, the transaction manager enforces the asset properties. So it schedules the operations of the transactions. So if there's two transactions operating on the same table, we have to look at which one came first because that one has to finish before the next one. So there's some scheduling happening. So a database that has heavy transactions tends to run a little slower because it, there's a lineup, right? If you go to the bank and there's only one teller open, that teller's not going to deal with two different people at the same time. Teller finishes giving you your money, then it deals with the next, then the teller deals with the next customer. Same idea. Um, and then there's two commands called commit and rollback. Uh, in other words, commit means it's good. Rollback means something went bad. Undo it. Um, so rollback signals that the transaction ended unsuccessfully. So in your programming code, whether it's Python, Patreon, whatever, you can issue, you open the connection to the database at the top. You can issue an SQL command called begin. And then you can do a bunch of SQL commands and you can detect whether or not one of them went wrong because you get an error back from the database server. And you can say, oh, I have an error. Issue a rollback. So you actually send out the rollback command and it just undoes everything it just did because it noticed something went wrong. On the other side of that is it finishes every step successfully. You get to the end of no errors, you issue a commit command. That tells the database server, this worked. We can now commit this to disk. So it marks that transaction as valid to commit. And then a few moments later, it gets written to disk. Um, so when we talk about recovery, uh, obviously prevention is better than trying to fix. You should be running on a reliable OS. This is a bit back to that whole backups thing and the security thing. Make sure your database server is secure. You should probably have your server running on a UPS or some sort of, some sort of surge protector. Uh, you don't want the server turning off in the middle of a transaction. There we go. You don't want the server turning off halfway through transactions. A really good server will actually have a battery backup on its disk controller so that anything that's being written to the disk will be played back before the server finishes booting. Um, but don't bet on that. That's the rate array. But you can't protect against everything. Uh, transactions should be durable, but we can't prevent all sorts of failures, system crashes, power failures, disk crashes, user mistakes, sabotage, and natural disasters. Um, system crashes and power failures can be mitigated. Uh, disk crashes can be mitigated using a RAID array. So you have you know, a redundant array of independent disks. And if one dies and it's a proper RAID array, you can just swap that drive out. The RAID array gets rebuilt. Then you hope you don't lose more than one disk at once. Um, user mistakes, yeah, there's, that's life. When the problem exists between the chair and the keyboard, there's nothing you can do for that. Um, you know, cash cashier at uh, at the bank puts in one extra zero because they're not paying attention. Oops, sabotage. Um, rogue administrator goes and nukes the tables. What you can do about that? Um, so. The way MySQL does it is it runs a transaction log. Um, different database servers call this something different, right? Right head log, there's a few different things. 
Um, so what the transaction log does, it records all the details of all the transactions, any changes the transaction makes to the database. So if the transaction is five insert statements, and then there's a commit, it actually puts down all five insert statements in that log. So it can play them back if it needs to. Uh, it also shows how to undo these changes if it has to you know, roll back. Um, and when the transaction completes and how, in other words, was it, if it completed successfully or not. The log is stored on disk, not in memory. Um, which is fine. It's, you hope you have your transaction log on a very fast disk. Because if you have a lot of transactions, that disk is going to take a shit kicking. So you normally want to use uh, solid state drives for your transaction log cache um, because they're fast, right? There's no head seeking, that kind of stuff. Um, so the reason goes to the disk. And people sound, says, hey, that sounds kind of funny. You know, you're going to take the data, you're going to read it in memory. Every step you're going to take, you're going to write down on a piece of paper every step you took, and then you're actually going to take those changes and then apply it. But what, is, what you're writing to the disk is not the data itself. You're just writing the things you did to the data. So two inserts, a delete, and an update. Commit. So that if it needs to play back, it just reruns those commands. You're not actually storing the data. It's just storing what happened. So what the amount of data it's writing to the disk is minuscule. You have to, even if the database table is like 37 million rows, the update statement might be, you know, 80, 80 bytes on the disk. So it's all good. Um, system failures. So at various times, the database takes a checkpoint. So it basically takes what's in the log, timestamps it, and then actually applies it to the disk, writes it out to the disk. That's called a checkpoint. Um, and then a, the transaction log gets a marker saying, well, this successfully happened at this date, so we don't need to play back anything before this. Um, a system failure means that all running transactions are affected. Uh, physical media. I want to make sure my microphone's still working. A little paranoid after last, the last time. Uh, physical media is not damaged, so server blows up, but the disks are still good. We go for it. So... The next couple of slides are going to have a few different graphs, and it's, we're going to be moving a line across this. So this example has five transactions happening at different times. There's a checkpoint and a system failure. So system failure, the server shut the bed. It's no longer functional. It's dead. Who knows what happened to it? So any transaction that was running at the time of failure needs to be undone and restarted. Any transactions that were committed since the last checkpoint need to be redone. So we, we actually got this that's going to move around. Um, so I'm going to actually skip the rest of the points on this slide. And I'll when I get to the little graph, I'll point out what it's talking about. Um, but we need to know the terms undo and redo. Undo is any transactions that were running at the last checkpoint before failure. So if a transaction started before the checkpoint, and it's still running at failure, those have to be undone. Uh, redo starts out basically empty. Um, so for each entry in the log, starting at the last checkpoint, if a begin transaction is issued, it adds a transaction to the undo pile. If it commit, it gets put into the redo pile. So we got our first moment here. So transaction started. Transaction one started, then transaction three started, then transaction two started. So one started, three started, two started. And the server is happily doing its thing, you know, da, 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 da. We get to the checkpoint. The checkpoint is the moment where the database server takes whatever's in memory and writes it to the disk. So it's being physically committed to the disk. Cool. We can see that transaction one started and ended before the checkpoint. So transaction one is complete, it's saved, it's neither the redo or the undo. However, transaction two and three are currently in the undo pot because it hit the checkpoint, but neither of them are completed, so they're currently in undo. So the server's at a state where transactions two and three have started, they're still ongoing, it writes some stuff to the disk, but two and three are still doing their thing. 
transaction four starts. So now we have two, three, and four all happily living in the undo log. And then transaction five starts. So now we have five, I mean, sorry, four transactions in the undo pile. So, so right now we're in a really bad situation because if the server were to crash right now, it would have to undo two, three, four, and five. In other words, those transactions never completed successfully, therefore they're not safe. The database will not be consistent, therefore they must be undone. Transaction two finally finishes, it goes commit. So in the log, the transaction log, it'll take transaction two, move it from the undo pile and put it into the redo pile. So that's, it's saying that if the server to crash right now, I know I can do transaction two safely. So we can redo transaction two on the reboot. It's safe. Three, four, and five are still doing their thing in memory. They're not done. Transaction four completes, gets committed. It also goes to the redo pile. Three and five are still sitting in the undo pile. And I don't know why there's not one more slide after this. The next step is we sh the server shits the bed on the failure right here. Server turns off, OS crashes, insert any number of horrible things that have happened to that poor machine. Transactions three and five are still in the undo. So email goes out, alert goes out, whatever, text message, whatever, however alert system you use. Server has crashed. Somebody runs to the server room, assume the stock prem. They run into there, they see that the server's powered off. But there's power in the power bar. Oh, odds are the power supply died. Replace the power supply, right? Slide it out, put a new one in, plug it in. Server turns on. The database server starts up. The service starts up. So MySQL starts, Postgres, whatever. It looks at the wall, the right head log, and it goes, oh, transaction two and transaction four, I can redo. Transaction three and five needs to be undone. So it'll actually start undoing three because it started first. Then it'll write two out. It'll write four out and undo five. So when it's done, it's as if transaction three and five never happened, but two and four completed successfully. And then it issues another checkpoint, writes it all out to the disk and the server is stable. Then it allows connections to start happening. Yeah. So, so um, I just understand what the meaning of solid line. That's the point in time. What's the point in time? So the solid line right here, we're showing that we're starting at the checkpoint. At, so at this point, we're at checkpoint. Transaction four starts. Transaction five starts. Oh. Transaction two finishes. Transaction four finishes. And there should be one more slide. I'm not sure where it might have it's after the next one. The failure reaches failure, servers turned off. So it's just to show at this point in time, things are in undo or redo. Let's see if there's a question in the exam about um, this scenario right here. Yeah. What do you need to like explain in order to actually get a good answer? Considering it's multiple choice, there's not a lot of explaining. They're more about... Um, well, you know, what's the command? What would be the command you'd use to start a transaction? What's the command you'd use to end a transaction? Those are the kinds of questions you're going to see. I use transactions every day. I don't think about this. Because I didn't understand that. So you so you got to think of your point in time, right? Where um Looking for a piece of paper I can cannibalize. Oh, this will work. This has been here since the start of the term. You got the question, you're coming up. Oh, you're helping. You're helping the example. You get to be my victim today. Okay, I will give you a pen. You're going to be my, my checkpoint. Okay? Do I actually have a pen? I've got pencils. I got a pen. We're good. Okay. I am going to be the right ahead log. You're going to be the checkpoint. Okay. Pen. I'm going to erase. We're actually going to do this exact example. 
but we're going to pretend there's two transactions happening at the same time, okay? So, transaction one starts. Person's putting in $50. I haven't told you to write anything yet because you haven't done checkpoint, right? And the transaction completes successfully. Fantastic. I start transaction two. I'm going to add $25, but it hasn't happened yet. Transaction three starts. I'm going to add $50. Okay, now we're going to do checkpoint. You write down 50. Now it's durable. Right? Yeah. That's like transaction one. Okay. Okay, now it's durable because it's on a piece of paper. Now, I'm going to start transaction four. Minus $50. We're, we don't even have a starting and endpoint. I'm just using random numbers. Okay? Yeah. Now, and time pro progresses, right? Time's continuing. We say, oh, transaction two is good. Transaction four is good. So well, I, you know, we're progressing in time. No, you don't get to write anything yet because I haven't told you a checkpoint. Okay, I just shit the bed. I, I am now incapable of doing anything else. This is my transaction log. The check marks right now are the redo. The empty one is the undo. Do you notice I haven't gotten you to do anything with that paper yet? I am now rebooting. I look at my transaction log, and I, because when the checkpoint happened, you basically put a line in the log saying the checkpoint happened here. Now it's going to go, okay. Two successfully plus 25. What's that? 75? Great job. We see transaction three never completed. So I am going to go, I'm not even going to tell you to do it okay. because it never completed successfully. So it's invalid. So it's as if never, this never happened. Oh, tra transaction four happened, minus 50. It's successful. So you do minus 50. And now you to be consistent. What's your total? 25. Good job. You work at the bank. Yeah. That is what this is explaining. Okay. Does that make more sense when you actually see going yeah, on a piece of paper? Sense. So that means it's not something is wrong because you added 50 somewhere, right? Yeah, I added 50, but it never got committed because it never had a chance to finish. Okay. Therefore, it should never be committed permanently to ink, right? See this board? I can keep going three plus this, five, blah, 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 six, blah, blah, blah. This is the, the log. This is temporary. Okay. That's the commit because it's on paper with ink. You can never, I cannot change that now. Okay, so you can only commit if that's successful right there. That in the log says it finished successfully. Server comes back. It's going to take anything that's in the redo pile and replay them. Okay. Because it never got to be written to the paper. Okay. Any undo will, will, it, never, go it will never go to paper. Okay. Okay. It's it. complicated than that, but that's the basics of it. Like, you know. Good. You can go sit now. All right. Undo and redo are like database tables, but they, uh... they're, they're, they're actually files on the disk. And basically, you got a, a redo disk, you got a redo file, and an undo file. Well, it's actually one file, but you know, whatever. Yeah, I, I know. But essentially, you've got two bins, and you're just taking tasks from one bin, putting them in the other bin. Once it's actually successful, it puts it in the other bin. And then the checkpoint fires off, and it says that, like, let's say the checkpoint fired off at this point right here. Once it sees the checkpoint, it's going to ignore all of these. It's only going to worry about everything after the checkpoint. So that's what that that's what this is showing us. But I guess that transaction number three is uh, is already logged from somewhere, no? Well, it's so, logged on the uh, the right the wall, but the fact that it never completed successfully means that it, it's never going to get written to the disk. So on the re server's reboot, it's as if it never happened. Uh -huh. So it's, it has to be manually checked to. Yeah, so at one point, somebody will go, "Hey, I thought I was deposit, I was uh, transferring five hundred dollars from myself to somebody else, and it shows that the money's still in my account. And the person never got it." Okay, let's try doing it again. So, yep. I want to check if I got it. The whole point of the transaction system is like creating a stack or a line of uh, certain transactions so that they either get complete and done, or they if they fail, 
digital they are way. completely thrown away. And yeah, that's exactly. It's either either it is done completely right into the disk, or it never happened. Yeah, there's transactions, but that's basically what it means. So that there's no in betweeners. Exactly. What I notice, if you're using uh, Wealth Wealth Simple, for example, and you transfer, you add money to Wealth Simple, it will say, okay, you have like let's say for example five hundred dollars into your Wealth Simple account, but your bank account will won't show that transaction. It like it won't show minus five hundred until like a few business days. That's that. What's happening is they they put a lock on that value. So if you were like BMO is a really good one for their app. When you how many of you use Amazon? How many of you actually use Amazon with your bank card as a debit card instead of a credit card? Have you ever actually noticed? I'm not going to show you as my bank account, but have you ever noticed if, if any of you are using BMO? Okay. Buy something on Amazon, wait 45 minutes and look at your bank account, and then you go on account info, you'll see that there's funds that are fr uh, that are frozen. So it'll show your account has $500, but $50 of it is frozen. Wealth Simple does the same thing. So the bank will lock the $500 you're going to transfer into Wealth Simple. It's still in your account until Wealth Simple accepts the fact that it's actually there. Then there's like a handshake, and that's you know it's a different kind of transaction because it's two separate systems. We're talking. These are transactions within the same systems. See, that money isn't available. No, it's locked. Okay. It's roughly the same idea, but that's called EDI, Electronic Document Exchange, and it's you know, even 15 years ago there was nothing that you could do something like that. Now, that's how much it's advanced. Okay, so Ford's recovery means that some of that transaction needs to be redone. That's you know the example I did with him. Uh, that was the ones the redo list. It brings the database up to date. The backwards recovery means we need to undo some transactions. So it starts from the last failed one and it works backwards. So it takes the redo, runs them in order this way, and it takes their undos in reverse order. So you know when you have you use undo and redo on your keyboard, you know you do control Z, yeah. control Z, control Z, and depending if your ID supports like control shift Z. So you can do undo, 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 or control shift Z. So the redo goes back in the order you did it. The undo goes in reverse order. The database does the same thing, but it just so happens it's handling it for thousands of transactions at a time because, you know, somebody's really smart wrote it that way. Um, this just to make sure things stay consistent. Uh, media failures. Um, damage on the disk is gone. The transaction log itself might be damaged. Um, media failures are the worst because if the transaction log gets pooched, you're done. The database server database files get pooched, you're done. Uh, that's why you want to make sure you got redundant when we talk about backups and hot backups and all that. That the media, the backups are to prevent the fact when the hard drives crash. There's not there's not a single transaction engine on earth that will survive a hard drive crash. Like if that drive dies and you happen to have your transaction log on the same drive as your main database, and that drive dies, you're done. You're coming, you're recovering from backups. There's no, there's no transaction on Earth. There's no transaction system on Earth that will save you from that. Um, system failures usually aren't bad because it's only usually affects whatever happens since the last checkpoint. Power supply dies, you know, OS crashes, blue screen to death, whatever. Uh, usually a reboot, you know, a repair and a reboot will fix that and database server brings it back. Uh, backups, well, we talked about backups. I think we know what backups are for. Um, uh, when it's recovering from media failure, um, you're going to restore the database from the last backup, and then you could use the transaction log to redo any changes made since the last backup. That's assuming that you lost just the database disks and not the transaction log disk, which is why you usually try to have the transaction log on a separate disk or partition, actually a separate disk than the rest of it. Um, if the transaction log is damaged, you can't do step two, which is the recovery. So you store the log on a separate physical device. That way, at least if you lose one, you're not going to lose both. Even replaying the transaction log is painful, but I mean, I showed, I showed you guys some of how that works during the backup lecture, where, you know, you can replay using the, uh, the bin log command. That's for MySQL. Um, Postgres is different, Oracle is different. So that's the technique to recover from this is unique to each database server. They're all different. Uh, concurrency. So the last little bit of transactions is concurrency. And um, a large database is used by many people. Many transactions are being run. 
it's desirable to let them run at the same time because the odds of two people touching the same record or records is very, very small. So if one person's updating their address, they're updating their phone number, who cares, right? They can update separate rows. Um, so it preserves isolation from each other saying, oh, it's only affecting this row, so we're good. It's only affect that row, we're good. It's only when we get two transactions trying to affect the same thing at the same time. Um, if we don't allow for concurrency, the transactions wrap run sequentially. Um, now imagine going back to our banking app example, I'm going to go transfer some money. So I start doing a money transfer and then he's with BMO. He decides to do a money transfer. He has to wait till I finish. Can you imagine what that would be like where, yeah, I want to transfer money, but I got to wait till the previous transaction it includes the person buying something at Loblaws as a debit card, another person buying something on Amazon. They all happen one after another. Transactions allow for concurrency. In other words, multiple things happening at the same time, as long as they're not touching the same thing. Um, because long transactions like backups, backups run in a transaction, single, they call them single transaction actions. Um, they can make people wait too long. Um, so when the con concurrency has a few problems, uh, because what happens is the different tasks get interleaved with each other. So when a transaction one starts, transaction two starts, transaction one gets committed, transaction two gets committed. There's always a risk where they're going to start touching each other's data. It's rare, but it's possible. So each transaction gets a slice of the pie for computing time. The database server needs CPU. So it takes turns operating each of the tasks of each of the transactions because the more cores you have, the more transactions that can run at the same time. But each core can only process one step of each transaction at a time. So you know they take turns. Um, the problem at that point is sometimes you have lost updates or uncommitted updates you know, server crashes, something else happens, uh, incorrect analysis, because uh, isolation is broken. So we try to avoid that. Um, the other concurrency problem we have is what happens if two things are trying to happen to the, the same table, the same row at the same time? There, you do realize there's no such thing as the same time in a computer, right? Yeah, because uh, it's impossible. Yeah, CPU runs on like nanoseconds or yeah. On yeah, exactly. one operation. Exactly. So it's impossible for two things to happen at the same time. So what will happen is you've got two transactions trying to edit the same piece of data at the quote, quote, same time. What really happens is whichever one started first gets to be finished. The second one will see if it was affected by whatever the first one did. And it'll try to do it. It'll try to redo it. So let's say transaction one's adding fifty dollars. Transaction two is taking twenty five dollars out. And two started before one was committed. What it'll do is it'll realize when it goes to commit two that one finished and that the state of whatever two was working with is no longer valid. So it'll undo and retry to do that transaction after the first one finishes. So it basically schedules saying, "Hey, oh, we're affecting the same thing at the same time. So one of you is going to have to wait and make sure that you know." They can actually do what they're supposed to do. Uh, there's a lot of theory on how all that works, like insane amounts of theory. So now I'm actually going to go do a quick demo. Um, so I have a table called, I'm going to use this chair. Um, I guess I got a table called Transdemo. It's the world's simplest transaction. And if you pay attention to what I'm about to do, I'm basically showing you how to do the lab. Okay. So you'll notice right now I have one connection. I'm going to open a second connection. How am I opening a second connection? I go back to my home tab and I click on that again. And now I've got two connections. Most of the time, that was the biggest question I had for this lab is how do you open a second connection? You literally will have two tabs. Each of these tabs are treated as individual connections to the database. They're not the same connection. So they see the database similarly, but different. So if I go um, and I run this in this tab, you'll see here's the data. I run this in this tab, here's the data. Cool. So we know that there is nine records ends in Jane. So I will begin a transaction. And for this lab, you actually have to do it all in one. You can't just hit begin, then hit run, then hit the next command, hit run. You got to put it all together, just so you know. 
insert into trans demo name values uh, oh man drawing a blank on a name here go let's go with this there I'm sure there's already a join in there. So I'm going to run this, but you'll notice I didn't put in commit. So I hit begin. I grab the whole thing and I go run. It shows one row affected. If I go to my other tab and I hit run, go to the end, you'll notice there's no URI. But if I come back to my first tab where this has happened, if I go select star from trans demo, Yuri is there. So, so what's happening right now is connection one is in the state of a begun transaction that has not happened yet. Whatever is happening inside this begin transaction, and because I've begun it and neither committed nor rolled back, the database server is saying, I'm waiting for something else to happen. <laughs> Whatever is happening inside this connection cannot be seen by anybody else. So that's the isolation here. That is isolation and concurrency because kind of like sessions. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a database, uh, a web server session where two different sessions don't see what the other session is doing. So connection one has something happening. Connection two does not see it. So I'm going to go back to connection one and I'm going to just issue the commit command. And I'm going to hit go. You will see if I go select, like, let's just undo this. It's easier than like that. It's there in connection two. I run it again. Now it's in connection two because the first one was committed. That means it's been written to the disk. The checkpoint has happened. It is now permanent. Like if I were to turn off my laptop right now, turn it on, Yuri will still be in the database. Let me restart this again. So I'm going to go begin and I'm going to go uh, delete, begin, semicolon, uh, delete from trans demo where id is equal to one i'm going to get rid of roberta i'm going to hit run okay it says one row affected i come over here roberta, roberta roberta is still here but this time i realized i made a mistake so i decide to roll back and i'm going to run it so now if i go Select star from trans demo. <laughs> You'll see Roberta is still there. And Roberta is still there because I undid it because I rolled back the transaction. <laughs> so Oracle is special because it runs in auto commit turned off. So pretty much every work you guys have done and probably in your level one database course, you were running in a mode called auto commit. You run a single SQL statement. Second, it sees this semicolon it commits. So even if you have 16 SQL statements in that one window and you hit run, it's going to do a commit after every semicolon. Oracle runs the other way around. It runs with auto commit turned off. You actually have to manually turn it on so that you can run 25 commands and until you issue that initial, it assumes that everything is in a transaction unless you tell it otherwise. So different servers will do things slightly differently. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server operates in auto commit. Postgres is auto commit. Um, MySQL has the ability to turn off auto commit. So you can see right there, there's a button here. And if I hit that, you'll see now that the, it's actually issued a begin command for you. Uh, obviously if you're writing code in Python, you don't have that button. So you got to issue the begin, you do some code and you do a command and then life is good. Um, but that that literally that's almost the entire lab right there I just did for you guys. Um that's literally all there is to the lab. He started, then it's okay. you, then it's him. So in the first dimension, when you ran begin and then uh, delete, for example, and then you didn't commit, that's in memory right there. It's in mem it's in both in memory and it's in the in the log. So the log has the fact that I did a delete, but there's no commit. And there's no checkpoint. So the robot robot only works if um, nothing has been on the disk yet. If it's on the disk that you once it's committed, it's done. You can either commit or you can roll back, but you cannot do both. 
He was first. He what moved like half a second fast. In the other instance, you uh, you uh, raise Roberta in commit, and you roll back in the previous. Uh... Oh, that's interesting. Let's go see what happens. Yeah, you're the first one's ever asked me to do that. That should be interesting. Okay, begin. Uh, delete from trans demo where ID is equal. Because honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. So we're going to find out. Go. So let's go make sure that this is valid. We go select star from trans demo. Okay, Roberta is gone. We go to this one here and we go uh, delete from. So this one will not have. And I go run. Look what's happening in the bottom row. Oh, it's waiting for the other one to finish. Either roll back or... Yeah. Remember earlier I was talking about concurrency that we're trying to affect the same row? That That's cool, actually. That's a perfect example. I've never even thought of doing that. Thanks. And now if I come here, it'll show that it, it's a completed, like it finished. I rolled back the first one. And now I go to my second tab and it shows one row affected. Okay, let's try this again. Because that this is really interesting. Um, where ID is equal to two, okay, and over here we will go uh, two. All right, so same circumstances as before. And I come over here and I go run. It's locked. The record is locked. It's not allowed to change it. I come over here and I go commit. So the opposite of what we just tried to do, right? We go commit. There's zero rows affected. Zero rows affected because the record wasn't there for it to delete anymore. That was cool. That was a good question, actually. It's the first time I've ever had anybody ask me to try to do that. Good. I'll add that to my routine. <laughs> okay. My conclusion from this uh, lecture always uh, disable auto comment. Um, no, it depends. I mean, if you're running a, a transaction that only does one thing, it's fine. I mean, by default, most servers run in auto commit. Because you don't have rollback if auto commit is on. Yeah, but it depends on what framework you're using. Like if you're using a programming framework, um, it's extra, it's significantly harder to issue the begin and the commit than it is to just issue the insert statement. It depends on what you're doing. Like if you are all you're doing is inserting a person's phone number, you don't need a full formal transaction for that. A single row auto commit will do the job just fine. I tend to leave everything in auto commit and I explicitly use transactions. So uh, one more question. Uh, so let's say I have a database called cars, okay? Yep. So when I uh, disable or enable auto commit, do I disable and enable it for the database or for this session only? It depends. When you connect and you issue the disable auto commit, like turn off auto commit, and you do it through the connection, then it's only for that connection. There's a way to turn it off at the server in the INI settings. Oh, there are two levels. Yeah, well, there's actually three levels. There's in the INI, there's a server wide service setting for it, and then there's the per connection. So you can choose just how much. Done. Because uh, it's, I thought maybe we. Maybe me and my friend are working on a, uh, with the same database, and he like disables auto commit, and I'm here on why is it acting so weird? Yeah, and that would be why. Yeah, um, that that was what happened. Then is suddenly you, he could be locking up entire tables. Yeah, and you can't. That's why you don't tend to use. That's why you tend to leave auto commit on. Okay. And you'd, so you'd use explicit transactions as the opposite of implicit transactions with explicit commits for every single thing because then you have to issue two commands to the database not one mm -hmm. every single time i want to insert a new a new user it's only one row you're going to insert but if you're using the auto commit turned off you're gonna to have to issue two commands every single time yeah the insert and then the commit yeah and while that insert is running you're locking that table because nobody else can insert anything until you've committed and your application crashes halfway through the insert What's the database server going to do? It may succeed. It may crash. It might, you know, things happen. Can I ask one more? Sure. One more. So we say on that screen, begin. 
we yep. write four lines of uh, delete. Then at the end, we do one commit, all of the four. Everything from the begin will. Yeah, all of them. Oh. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Okay, one in the back. I want to change uh, back to the transaction recovery. Okay, hang on, let me bring that back up. Transaction recovery. Yeah, Which one? Maybe 16. Yeah. In here, these ones. Uh, do, uh, do you mean that to is mean you have to roll, roll back the transaction? Yeah, undo the rollback. Okay. Yes. Um, sorry, I, I, I still didn't understand what the solid, solid line. The salt line is just that point in time. Check, check point for life. No, the checkpoint is when it gets written to the disk. The solid line is just a point in time. So there's a bunch of things happening, and you know time's always moving, right? So at that point in time, that's what's happening. That's what that line's showing. Sorry. At that moment. So, and all, so there's five transactions. At that moment of that solid line, this is what is happening. So in this case, Transaction two is done, so it got moved to the redo. That's what that line is saying. Now, the next time it moves over, the line is moved now transaction four. That's the next thing that happened. So at the point where transaction four happens, the solid line, there's two in the undo, two in the redo. And then the next solid line should be on the failure. So, uh, but the slide's gone for some unknown reason. So it means a transaction and recovery will um, excuse uh, automatically. Yeah. As as time goes on, as things get committed or not committed, the section just, uh, yep. or, yep. or, as the line moves, it's just showing a point in time. It's like a, a timeline. You know when you edit video, you look at video editing and you see as you watch the video in, in the bottom, you'll see like a line moving? That's your timeline. And that line is that moment in time. This is what that line is. Imagine this is a video. And at that moment in time, that's what's happening at that very moment. So that line is just showing it. At each point of something happening, at this point, this is what the state of the database is. That's what the slides are showing. Okay. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times.